Thank you for joining us for this month's Virtual Curators Tour. I'm Jenna Gilley, Associate Curator of Exhibitions at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, and I'll be your guide today. We will be looking at the exhibition, Built Blast, Fort Wayne's Fashion Designer, which I am so pleased to have curated. Before diving into Bill's life, I'd like to take a minute to explain why a fashion exhibition has made its way into our museum. June 22nd, 2022, the date the show opened, would have been Bill Blass's 100th birthday. I, along with a team of dedicated women, wanted Fort Wayne to celebrate a man from our town who truly revolutionized the world with his craft. Today, if the name Blass is known, it's usually associated with an older crowd of rich and coiffed high society women of years past. This is a shame because it both trivializes Blass's work and eliminates his real contribution to fashion, which was redefining sensibility. Before Blass took the field, dresses with cinched waist and feminine frills were the expected garb of the fashionable American woman. Blass was a main player in eventing American sportswear, which looked to relax separates with a dash of class for the woman who wanted to get things done. Through this virtual tour and many events spanning 100 days throughout the summer, I hope you find beauty, appreciation, and above all pride in one of our hometown heroes. Now we can jump into the tour. Before he was society's darling, William Ralph Blass was a simple boy with a dream from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Born on June 22, 1922, Blass grew up in a modest house on South Calhoun Street. His father, a traveling hardware salesman, took his own life when Blass was only eight years old, leaving his mother Ethel to raise Bill and his older sister Virginia in the shadow of the Great Depression. Blass's childhood, however, was not totally bleak. He happily assisted his mother with her dressmaking business in the family's spare room. Fashion magazines and the local movie house served as glamorous respites. Blass noted the striking costumes the actresses wore, particularly those of Carol Lombard, another Fort Wayne native, and began sketching elegant ensembles. While still in high school at Southside, he began selling his designs to a clothing manufacturer in New York for $25 each, a fortune during the Depression, along with running a seasonal egg painting business for extra cash. On Saturdays, he took a class at the Fort Wayne Arts School, which honed his technical skills. Both films and the creative process allowed Blass to escape small town Midwestern life. At 17, Blass gathered his earnings and headed for the place of dreams, New York City, launching his 50 year career in the fashion industry. While he physically left the fields of Northern Indiana, Blass would forever remain a part of the place that raised him as his designs embodied simplicity, ease, and a conservative polish that was Midwestern to the core. Rather than designing for a single woman, Blass's widely popular trunk shows and wicked sense of humor resounded with clientele, all just friends, as he stated, across the country. It was precisely because of this heartland ethic that he succeeded. After all, at the end of the day, as he once coyly grinned and said, he was, and will always be, just a Hoosier. I decided to start the exhibition logically, where it all began, in multiple senses. This sketch is one of Blass's earliest drawings, and one of two Blass sketches housed in our permanent collection. Completed when he was still a student at Southside High School, this sketch was made for Mrs. Blanche Hutto, one of Blass's teachers at Southside, and an important community member. To pass the time in class, Blass often doodled elegant fashion drawings on the corners of his textbooks and homework assignments. He gave sketches to favorite friends and teachers. The first Bill Blass creations were worn by his friends to Southside's prom in 1939. Mrs. Hutto gifted these drawings to the museum in 1982. When I was first asked to assist with this Blass project, these sketches were the first and only things that I had to offer for a potential Blass exhibition. It's really exciting looking around the galleries and to see how much everything's grown from just these two drawings. The second example we'll be discussing today is our first piece of fashion, a sweet cream cashmere wool dress that Blass designed for Maurice Rentner in 1968. Before he had his own label, Blass worked as a sketch artist and eventually designer for several brands, one of whom was Maurice Rentner. 
Ratner gained exceptional popularity in the late 1960s because of Lass's witty advertising strategy and young, fresh designs. The example from your screen is no different. When Blass entered the fashion sphere, American fashion was strongly influenced by French couturiers. Never one for fuss and pomp, Blass preferred the casual elegance of the ladies he grew up watching on the silver screen, and the classic tailoring of English styles. When the mod movement of the 1960s swept through London, Blass took note. Minimal, youthful silhouettes, as seen in this mini-dress, reinvigorated American style. Sleeve slits, extending from shoulder to wrist, add a coy sense of allure to an otherwise elegantly modest dress. Blass is credited with saying, the little black dress is always better in white. A fitting quote when viewing this ensemble. Continuing into the next decade, the next piece we'll be looking at is a green military style coat from 1970. This coat has many naval features, including its double-breasted style, gold buttons with anchors, and striped cuffs, which is used to denote a Navy officer's rank. Rather than the classic navy blue, Bill has fashioned this coat in a more vibrant version of the classic military green. Blass drew inspiration from military styles for many of his collections. During World War II, Blass served in the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, also known as the Ghost Army. This top secret group, comprised entirely of young creatives, sought to impersonate other Allied Army units to deceive the Germans into thinking battalions of troops were stationed where the minuscule Ghost Army resided. Their story was only recently declassified, and their accomplishments helped save thousands of lives. This experience had an immense impact on Blass's life and work. Structured tailoring is a staple in any Blass garment, with his most signature pieces being jackets and coats. Though Blass was not the first designer to pull from military attire in women's fashion, he was one of the first American designers to do so. Today, military-inspired garments like this peacoat join combat boots, bomber jackets, and aviators as staples of the average American's wardrobe. Continuing on our fashion journey through Blass's career, the next piece is a testament to another Blass signature, branding. Blass realized the untapped potential of designer branding early on, creating lines of licensed swimwear and children's clothes as early as the 1960s. By 1989, Blass's roster of 30 licenses, including perfumes, eyeglasses, cars, and even chocolate, reached $450 million. At the time of his death, that number would climb to 97 licenses in an annual intake of $700 million. Blass often noted that he lost money on couture. Branding was where he made most of his money, with jeans and bedsheets being his best sellers. The curve extending from neck to hem of this sculptural coat is a subtle reference to the brand's mirrored BB logo. Other examples of brand placement on Blass designs can be found in BB embossed buttons, shaped bags, and monogram sweaters. Quickly following European brands like Fendi and Gucci, Blass was one of the first American couture designers to prominently feature a logo on clothing, a device famously adopted by next-generation American designers Calvin Klein and Ralph Lauren. Ending out our fashion tour is a beautiful evening dress from 1995, created at the end of Blass's almost 60-year career which draws inspiration from the mosaic-like works of Austrian painter Gustav Klimt. Blass created several artist-inspired collections from the late 1980s to the early 90s, also taking motifs from the Fauvist painter Henri Matisse. Although the designer intended his designs to be worn and not ogled at, in fact one of his pet peeves was women who fussed too much over their appearance, his impeccable craft and innovation begs the question where the line between craft, design, and art is drawn. As with most couture dresses, this piece is one of a kind, hand embroidered, and most likely cost $5,000 or more at retail. Asked why his clothes were so expensive, Blass replied, I'm an avid believer that we have to make clothes in this country, therefore we pay more money the cost of labor and fabrication is what makes the clothing expensive. As fast fashion continues to grow, 
the craft of couture is quickly becoming an anomaly. Slowly, however, consumers are becoming aware of the immense negative impact clothing production and waste has on the world and are demanding more eco-friendly options from brands. Thank you for joining us on today's Virtual Curators Tour. I can say that it's truly been an immense joy researching and sharing the story of this important and generous man. If you would like to know more about the designs, drawings, and never-before-displayed Bill Blass ephemera, I highly encourage you to check out Bill Blass, Fort Wayne's fashion designer at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, now open until September 18th. For more information on Blass's childhood in Fort Wayne, his efforts in the Ghost Army, his marketing prowess, and personal life, please also see the dual part of this exhibition at the History Center, open until September 30th. For more information on all of the Blastastic events going on in Fort Wayne for this 100-day celebration, go to the Bill Blass Blast Facebook page where all events will be listed. A special thanks goes out to the Sage Collection at Indiana University for loaning these pieces to us and also helping us install them. Uh, we also want to give a special thanks to Bill Blast Limited, who loaned some of the ephemera and a few of the dresses for these shows. I also want to give a big thanks to our partners, the History Center, the Veterans National Memorial Shrine and Museum, Vera Bradley, O5 Scoop Shop, and our sculptor Greg Mendez, plus many other community members. We couldn't have done this project without you all, and we're very thankful for your support.